So welcome everybody to the defense of uh, Wasim uh, Amidouche uh, to get the uh, habilitation and the research of the University of Rennes. Uh, so just let me introduce the, the jury. So first, I'm uh, Christine Guimau from Henri and Rennes. I've been designated to chair this uh, jury. So we have three, three rapporteurs. So, uh, Maria Martini, who is professor at the University of Houston in the UK, who is with us uh, remotely. Monsef Gavouche, on my, my left, who is professor at Tampere University in Finland. Jenny Benoit Pinot, who is professor at the University of Bordeaux, my right here. Then we have uh, two examiners, or three, including myself. So Jens Renner Ohm, who is a professor at Aachen University in Germany, and who is with us uh, remotely. And Frédéric Dufault, on my right here, who is a research director at CNRS, uh, Central Sucre France. So although the format for habilitation now is uh, open or free, it's up to the candidate to decide. I think what he must present prepares a, a defense or presentation of 45 minutes for us, and then we'll have uh, the time for further questions. So it's up to you, Wassim. Uh, merci, Madame la Présidente, and Madame la Présidente. So uh, I will present to you today uh, my work on uh, video compression, uh, entitled uh, Video Compression from Aid Distortion Optimization to Real Time Implementation uh, for the degree of Administration and Dirigé des Recherches of the uh, University of Rennes. So before starting, I want to introduce myself with this uh, slide. So first, I got my PhD in 2010, end of 2010 at the University of Poitiers and the Eastern Lab. Uh, I worked on joint source channel coding uh, for the scalable video transmit transmission over MIMO channels, uh, wireless channels. Then I joined the Canon Research Center in Rennes as a joint junior scientist, where I worked also on uh, video streaming. Uh, in 2013, I joined IETR, Institute Electronic and Technical Numeric at Rennes as postdoctoral, where I worked on a uh, uh, European collaborative project. Then I got associate professor position in September 2015 uh, at INSEAD Rennes, which is an engineering school in uh, France. And uh, uh, later, I joined uh, ECOM Research Institute as an academic member in uh, September 2017. Uh, at the part time 25% uh, of my research time. And this presentation is uh, organized in five uh, sections. So I first give the, the context and challenges. I present quickly uh, my teaching and research activities. I will uh, talk about uh, some contribution and then I will present some future work and I conclude this presentation with a summary. Uh, so the context. So the first question we can ask is uh, why efficient and sustainable compression is important. This can be answered by two numbers. As we can see in this figure, we have uh, that giving an increase in uh, internet, global internet traffic uh, in exabyte uh, per month. We have seen like a significant increase during the six last years. And video represents in uh, 2022, 90% of the global internet traffic. And this also contributes to 1% of the global greenhouse gas emission, which correspond to the emission of a country like Spain. So this increase in video streaming is caused mainly by three factors. So the first one is, uh, by the first factor is the emerging video streaming application, like uh, over the top uh, streaming and uh, optimal video. Like for example, one, uh, one and a half uh, uh, billion of hours of video are watched on uh, uh, YouTube, Facebook, and the Netflix per day. And as we can see in this figure also, there is an increase in uh, different application, for example, video conferencing uh, caused by the global health situation and was used in many practical uh, applications like uh, e-health and e -health. And there is also significant increase in new application like uh, video gaming, as we can see here, uh, increased from 1% to 4% uh, uh, the global video traffic. The second factor is the new video formats, like high resolution video, high frame rate, and high dynamic range. High dynamic range to require a higher bandwidth. And uh, today we have around 22% of uh, video transmitted in 4K resolution. And there is also more interest in non-conventional video formats, like sound, cloud, light field, and holography. That requires also a higher uh, bandwidth uh, to uh, get to uh, enable a realistic and immersive quality experience up to six of freedom visualization percent. And finally, the third factor 
is the increase in uh, mobile devices and machine to machine communication. As we can see in this figure, as, as the video increase according to uh, the device, you can see like uh, 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 mobile devices represent half of uh, uh, devices that transmit uh, video content. And there is also uh, machine to machine communication that represents today half of connected devices. And the part of uh, video traffic for machine to machine has significantly increased recently, uh, as we can see here, from 4% to 7%. So, all this, uh, uh, this news. but also for machines. And, and addressing this challenge is to reduce carbon emission and enhance the prosperity of the country. So how we can address uh, these uh, challenges? We can develop, uh, this can be uh, done by developing a new video coming standard, like the two organizations uh, to its working group like our IBC advanced high efficiency uh, video coding HVC and versatile video coding developed in 2003 in a license in 2003 2013 and 2020 and each founder as we can see here it came with a reference software that implements all the tools on coder and decoders and it brings uh, it's enabled to uh, half the bit rate uh, with uh, respect to its predecessor standard. Uh, but this uh, increase in coding efficiency, it comes at the expense of complexity. For example, uh, HVC is uh, 1.2 uh, times more complex and 1.6 more complex than uh, AVC for encoder and decoder. And uh, VPC, for example, it's enable this uh, halving this space for the same quality at the expense at the expense of uh, much higher complexity, which is each times for encoder and two times for decoder compared to the H in this random access center configuration uses broadcast transmission 4K and 8K for this uh, of the decoder and uh, they all follow the same So the input image XT is adaptive according to according to the local activity of the system. Then we perform antra and enter prediction to remove antra and enter redundancy. Then the difference between the predicted frame is filled here uh, with uh, uh, the original frame, uh, the, what we call the residual, are first transformed to decorrelate uh, this signal and compact it in only few coefficients. And we perform also quantization to remove some coefficients which are less significant, uh, which are less significant regarding the human system and enable to, this is the lossy part of compression, to uh, perform encoding at different rates. And then we have entropy encoder that encodes syntax elements from all these blocks uh, to reduce further the uh, statistical redundancies and construct bit stream, which is characterized by the rate. So, as I said, the standard defines only the decoder, and the decoder performs inverse operation of the encoder. Uh, in addition, we can perform also in the Order. Uh, in addition, we can perform also in loop features that enhance the quality of the decoded frame because of the encoding set. And as we can see here, the Antra prediction is uh, uh, is performed with a life scoring block at the up to reference frame after the in loop feature. So the encoder uh, has many parameters that are uh, so here. The, the quality of the decoded frame is characterized by the distortion, which is the distance between the decoded frame and the original. So the parameters has many encoder that are optimized during the encoding. And from this level came the, mainly the complexity of the encoder. And it's optimized this loss function, which is the way between uh, the distortion with uh, 
like a Russian multiplier multiplied by the rank. So the encoder tries to find the optimal parameters that minimize this uh, rate deform uh, contribution in this uh, in the hybrid video coding context. So we have we have identified three positions. The first one is pre-processing that we can perform adaptive spatial and temporal resolution or denoising to increase the coding efficiency or to reduce the conflicts. We can also compute some features uh, to uh, also to enhance the coding efficiency as pre-processing. And uh, contribution in this position are not normative since it doesn't change the syntax of the decode. Second position is at the level of the coding tools. Uh, so we can have contribution at different coding tools. And this can be normative or non-normative, whether uh, this modification change the syntax of the bit scheme and the decoder or not. And the third position is at the level of the post-processing. And here we can also uh, perform some super resolution, quality enhancement, temporal uh, interpolation or pin grain synthesis to enhance further the decoded video. And it is also non-normative since it doesn't change the decoder. But it can be it can be guided with the beta data that's transmitted from the encoder. So this is the three positions in the hybrid video coding. And recently, uh, a new uh, solution has been developed from 2016 and uh, 2017. This is what we call uh, uh, which is what we call learning based coding. It relies on auto encoder and arithmetic encoding. Here we have a name code. Uh, image which is processed by this uh, encoder uh, with uh, that performs uh, like analysis to construct this latent variable. Then it is quantized and encoded uh, with an arithmetic encoder. And the arithmetic encoder and arithmetic decoder are guided by a probability model. And the decoded latent space here is then uh, processed by the decoder to reconstruct uh, the decoded frame, which is uh, here uh, at x. So the parameters of the encoder and the decoder are also optimized with the stochastic, stochastic gradient descent optimization by minimizing this loss function, which is also the same loss function, uh, which is the cost between the distortion and uh, the rate. The only difference here, since the quantization is not a differentiable operation, it is replaced by a noise which is provided here as delta y, which follows an uniform distribution between minus half and half. And we can also have uh, hyper, um, hyper priors for the arithmetic encoder and decoder that are optimized uh, during the training. And during the testing, we can use uh, classical like uh, uh, quantization. So this is the first uh, step that give us the context of research around the video coding. Uh, now I want to uh, give you a brief introduction about my teaching and the research. Uh, 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 since I am an associate professor, so I teach around uh, 200 hours per year at the electrical uh, engineering department of INSA Duran. And here I give the repartition of the courses I teach, like at the third year I teach signal and system, signal processing and probability. The fourth year, I teach like image processing, machine learning, optimization, and Python programming. And in the fifth year, I am uh, more involved in uh, uh, supervision of a uh, uh, project. And the teaching repartition uh, in terms of lectures, we have 16% of lectures. The majority of the part is practical work with uh, 42%. And the 16% are dedicated for uh, supervision of project and uh, uh, quarter for uh, tutorials. This is typical what we do in engineering uh, schools. I also uh, teach around uh, thought uh, around, around the 37 hour at the electrical engineering department of INSA Oromet in Morocco between 2017 and 2020. I propose every year also exploration project at the mathematical department of INSA Duran. And I did also several visits at uh, UPM, Technical University of Madrid in Spain, and Tampere University in Finland for education. Uh, so I have also some teaching responsibility. I am uh, responsible of industrial partnership of the department. I also lead the industrial project. I manage the industrial project proposed at the final year of the department. I also uh, manage uh, for years research and innovation project at the fourth year of the department. 
So now I will talk uh, more about my research activities. So my research interests are uh, on three topics. The first one is video compression. The second one is the design of real-time software and hardware video codec. And finally, security and frequency in machine learning and multimedia data. But today I will cover more the first uh, two uh, topics. Uh, so in this context, <laughs> I have also some uh, research responsibility. I am the member of uh, Scientific Adversary Board of Inside the RAN. I coordinate also video coding activities of uh, our research team, uh, VADER. I lead also technological transfer, uh, transfer projects to transfer research uh, uh, results to industry. I am also a member of Selection and Validation Committee uh, called Image Réseau that manages industrial projects in the uh, Brittany region and the uh, I have also been, I have been <laughs> But also in several collaborative projects. So I started in 2013 by a European project, uh, Hybrid Broadcast Broadband Video Services, which was a, a European UK project where we worked on uh, real time implementation of the scalable extension of HPC. Then I managed also research of a second European project, uh, 4K Road Process. Where we propose a solution on high dynamic. So, under this uh, forever uh, project, where we developed a real time software decoder compliant with HP standard. And later, I also worked on EFG uh, project, which is also a national and digital project, where we developed uh, a real time decoder, uh, this time for uh, BVC uh, standard. And the three UMS project is a regional and digital project. We also optimized the OpenDVC decoder for Embedded platform. And uh, currently, uh, I have I am leading two uh, uh, regional projects with industry uh, for the optimization of the video transmission over 5G for nested project and in the cloud for the big tech project. So, in terms of uh, uh, this uh, topic of research of video and this uh, uh, slide like are organized this uh, phd students according uh, of the phd and also according to the topic from video co coding compression to the software and the hardware design and also i give here in numbers one two three four the contribution of each phd according to the first classification we defined before this pre-processing coding tools post-processing and learning base so as you can see here we start we started work uh, with each with the Tech in collaboration with PDF and Bitcoin, who worked on the optimization <laughs> of scalable video uh, expansion of HPC to uh, have the highest coding efficiency. Uh, Paula Ono with the Atom company has developed the scalable HPC encoder for me. The predictive coding complex elements in hybrid video coding in collaboration with Orange, Alexandre Mercat, Thomas Amstoy, and, and uh, Maxime Chon, uh, in collaboration with Ericsson, has worked on how to uh, compute optimal com compilers uh, in enter configuration with taking into account the distortion and propagation during the temporal and spatial prediction. And in this uh, presentation, I will present briefly the work of Dan Iru in collaboration with uh, BCOM as pre-processing, the work of Theo Ladjun uh, in collaboration with Orange as learning-based uh, compression solution, and the work of Alexandre Tissier uh, as the complexity rejection of the VBC encoder, which is at the second uh, level in the, in the coding uh, to reduce the complexity of VBC encoder. And currently, I have two PhD ongoing, Zubida Amer with Interdigital, working on pre-processing and post-processing, and Marwa Tarshuli uh, with ATEM on this uh, learning-based solution. Uh, in terms of publications, so here I give a uh, number of conferences in green and the number of journals in red per year. 
uh, we are trying to, to be uh, very uh, active in terms of contribution. We have around 20, 20 in terms of publication. Uh, we have around uh, 20 uh, publications per year. And here uh, today we have around uh, 45 uh, journals published in uh, journals in the topics of image processing and video coding, like uh, TCSVP, Transaction on Circuit and System for Video Technology, Transaction on Consumer Electronics for the Hardware and Software Designs, and also uh, Broadcasting, Image Processing, and Mixed Media. And we have also published more than 100 conference papers in conferences in these topics also, like ICAS, ICIP, PCS, ICME, and for Data Cooperation Conference. So this is uh, a brief uh, uh, introduction of my research and uh, teaching activity. Now I will try, I will talk about uh, these three contribution I have already introduced. So the first one is about uh, variable frame rate for green video broadcast issued in TCSP in 2021 recently. So as I said before, uh, the contribution is at the level of pre-processing and the objective is to introduce higher frame rate is here we say higher than 100 frames per second at low bandwidth and low complexity. So uh, high frame rates enable to, of course, enhance the perceived video quality, but it is uh, content dependent. So we have this enhancement only for uh, uh, videos with high motions, and it's enabled to elevate temporal artifacts like motion, blur, and aliasing. But for example, doubling the, uh, the frame rate it, it increases also the bit rate with up to 15%, and it's also double the complexity of the encoder and the decoder. And our solution target to uh, compute uh, what we call critical frame rate among three frame rates, 30, 60, and 120 uh, frame per second, uh, which is typically used in a broadcast system. And this critical frame rate is the minimum frame rate that preserves the high frame rate quality. And this solution is also adaptive and local, since the adaptation is performed at the level of chunk of uh, four consecutive frames. As we can see, here, as we can see here, we have input video. Then we have this. Uh, we have our solution that computes the optimal frame rate for this critical frame rate without rising, decreasing the quality of the original video. Then we perform temporal dose sampling, encoding, decoding, and at the decoder we perform temporal upsampling. To recover the original, uh, the, to recover the, uh, the highest frame rate, and then we display the video. So, for this uh, solution, we uh, propose to use two random forest classifier. Uh, uh, as we can see here, the first random forest classifier takes some features, like uh, handcraft features, and decide if we encode at uh, the highest frame rate or disseminate. And if we disseminate, we have a second classifier that decides if we have to encode a 60 or 30 frame per second. And we propose this two classifier because we use uh, different uh, handcrafted features for each classifier, and they are also trained uh, separately. As we can see here, uh, as handcrafted feature, we use very simple features for to keep them low complexity, for example, the gradient, motion vectors, and colloquial and collocated pixel difference between two adjacent frames. And here, as we, you can see, we have two figures from uh, corresponding to the two classifiers. And we selected uh, uh, the first features that enable the highest, uh, the highest performance. And here in the performance, we consider uh, these uh, critical errors that uh, decreasing the frame rate uh, compared to the ground truth uh, we try to prevent this critical uh, critical errors because we decrease the preserved quality. So the first classifier we use it 26 features, and for the second class classifier we use it 11 features. In this slide we see uh, the contribution in green of temporal features and in orange for spatial features for each classifier. So the first classifier 120 and frame dissemination on the left and on the right for uh, 30 and 60 frames per second. And here uh, we compute this uh, delta, of, uh, delta of information gain, which is computed information gain gives high value for uh, uniformly distributed, uh, uniform distribution and low uh, values for a squeezed distribution. So we try after uh, selection of the futures and the threshold uh, to select the features that have the highest impact that enables the best separation of our uh, training set. 
uh, as we can see here, since the first, uh, since the first model uh, is more related to uh, temporal features, we use first more temporal features than spatial features. And in the second classifier, since it works at lower features in 60 and 30, we can find first some temporal features and then some uh, spatial features. So uh, now to uh, train the two random forest uh, classifier, we have to construct a data set. So to do that, we selected uh, 360 DDU at high frame rate uh, from a uh, public data set, data set BBI high frame rate and become an harmonic data set. And here we conducted subjective tests with using simultaneous double stimulus for continuous evaluation protocol. So uh, we showed in side by side so the reference video at 120 frames per second and the test video uh, whether at 30 and 60 and we show them with two repetition and then the viewers uh, select uh, the highest quality. Uh, we used so two, uh, we did two experiments, one for the training set with this large number of videos and we did also a formal uh, with experts. And then we did a formal uh, test uh, evaluation uh, uh, with the naive viewers for the testing. So as we can see here, we provide for the two classifiers. So on the left, always uh, 120 frame dissemination. Uh, the confusion matrices for a tenfold cross validation on the training set. As we can see here, we have high accuracy on the diagonal, which is uh, higher than 80% of uh, correct classification. And we try also to minimize this error uh, when we uh, decide to lower the frame rate and the ground truth is at 60 and we decide to lower to 30. This is the critical error. We try to uh, minimize, to represent only 9% uh, in terms of performance. And here give the overall uh, performance for the, three, for the three classifier. As we can see here, this critical error is uh, from 30 to 120 frames per second is very low, around 3%. And we have also a uh, good accuracy for the three uh, classes. Uh, now to uh, test uh, this algorithm on testing set, we selected 15 uh, high frame rate video sequences. We represent here according to, to their temporal information and spatial information. And as we can see here higher, we have high motions and in low the part, we have the low motions. If we consider, uh, for example, Rigby, library and drawing, to represent uh, three specific videos with high motion, library, low motion, and drawing with a very low uh, motion. Uh, and these uh, figures give us the adaptation of our uh, variable frame rates algorithm here between the three frame rates according to the frame number for each test video sequences. We have selected test for uh, 10 video sequences for the subjective test. And as we can see here, the adaptation is very local. And if again we take these three videos, row, uh, rugby seven with high motions, the algorithm decides to encode it in 120 frames per second to keep the highest uh, quality uh, of the original video. For the rowing with low motions, we always use uh, 30 frames per second. And for library, which has uh, local motions at the beginning and then low motions, we use 120 and then 30 frames per second at, at the end. So we have adapted uh, frame rate at local level with the uh, uh, chunks of four frames. And uh, we performed also a subjective evaluation uh, uh, with this 10 uh, the test video sequences using the same protocol. And here we, we show differential mean opinion score with the 95 confidence interval. Uh, the colors like red is for the highest frame rate, 120 frames per second. Our algorithm BFR variable frame rate is provided in green. And in uh, yellow and blue, we have the algorithm we have uh, encoding at 60 frames per second and 30 frames per second. What we can notice like the 120 and our algorithm have the same quality, which is the highest quality. Uh, with overlapping and uh, confidence interval. And for other frame rates, 60 and 30, it depends on the characteristic of the video. For example, for Rigby, we have low performance because we have high uh, motions. And if we take uh, a rowing one with a very low motions, we have good performance even at uh, 30 frame pass. So uh, to finish this part, I give in this table uh, the bitrate saving uh, the encoding uh, 
complexity reduction and decoding complexity reduction. And the same here, uh, since we did this uh, frame dissemination for rowing, which, is, which has uh, the lowest frame rate, we have the highest speed rates, and we have the highest complexity decrease uh, for the encoder and decoder, around 60% uh, for both encoder and decoder. For uh, rigby, with the very high motions, we don't have any gain for the bit rates or for the complexity since we encode exactly as the highest frame rate. And for library, uh, which is composed with these two uh, steps, we have like uh, an intermediate gain of 5% and 39% uh, uh, complexity reduction for encoder and 35% for decoder. And in average for this uh, 15 uh, test sequences, we have 4.3% uh, of bit rate saving and 30% of complexity. So now I will talk about machine learning for the encoder complexity reduction. Uh, this work has been submitted also. Uh, it is uh, under review at uh, image processing. So uh, the idea uh, is to reduce the DVC encoder complexity while minimizing the coding loss. And this contribution is, as I said, at the coding tools and more particularly on the block partitioning. And it is non-normative since it doesn't impact uh, the decoder. So before, before introducing this solution, I want to say briefly how partitioning is performed in DVC. <laughs> So we have uh, quad tree partitioning. So each block it is partitioned in quad tree. So we have at each level two decision, uh, quad split in quad tree or not split. This is what uh, was proposed for HPC. And for VVC, we added this nested recursive multi-type tree with binary splits horizontally, vertically, or ternary splits horizontally and vertically. So this enable uh, uh, more uh, rectangular partitioning to adapt to the local activities of the pixel. But of course, it increased the research, the search space of the encoder and increased the encoder complexity. And this is just a picture showing like in the uniform uh, area, we have uh, large blocks. And in the textured area, we have a very small blocks with adaptive uh, shape according to the local activities of the pixel. And so this partitioning is uh, encoder. Since encoder performs exhaustive search, so it's enhanced the coding efficiency, of course, by 8% compared to only using quad partitioning. But it's increased the complexity of the encoder by uh, 10 times in all Anshara configuration. So the idea here is to leverage the content characteristic to predict the optimal partitioning by skipping unlikely splits. As we see, as we have seen before, we have six possible splits, and the idea is to predict them and uh, don't test them by the encoder. Here we give the overall scheme of this uh, process. So as input, we give to uh, uh, machine, uh, like a deep neural network, convolutional neural network, an input uh, block of size 64 by 64, with some borders here. And then this uh, convolutional neural networks predict a vector of probability, and each probability will correspond to a split of uh, small blocks of size four by four. And then this picture of probabilities of uh, partitioning, uh, we can also call it as spatial features, is processed by a uh, uh, classification uh, model that's enabled to predict a vector of six probabilities that correspond to the probability of each possible split in VVC. And then the encoder performs only the N Bits that's having the n top probability from uh, this vector. For example, if we are, if we take a top n, we will uh, perform only uh, two uh, splits. So to summarize, uh, for the first step, we take an input block processed by convolutional neural network, and each probability level here corresponds to the split of an edge of size of a small size of block four by four. And for this convolutional neural network. Uh, we inspired by a ResNet, and we try to keep it very low complexity with around uh, 200 uh, K parameters. And these uh, uh, neural networks have been optimized by minimizing the mean squared error between the ground truth probability model that contains only one and zeros probability and the predicted probability. And we give also to this model at the last layer, the QP is the quantization parameter, since it is important 
and has an important impact on the partition. As we can see here, I give some results on the partitioning with this convolutional neural networks. In the first row, we have the ground truth at different QP. As we can see here, for high QP and low bit rate, we have uh, large blocks. And for low QP, high bit rate, we have uh, small blocks. And here in the second row is the predicted partitioning according to the different uh, probabilities uh, ranges, which are represented here with different colors. As we can see, can uh, predict with uh, some accuracy uh, the, the ground truth partitioning uh, use it to use it for the training of. So this partitioning vector of probability is then uh, provided to a machine learning model. Uh, but uh, during the partitioning, we can have block of different size. Uh, here, this matrix gives different sizes of the width and the height of different blocks. And each size of block, we can perform only uh, some partitioning. For example, 64 by 64, we can have only quad tree and no split. For example, for 32 and by 32, we can have all the six possible splits. So in our model, we uh, built 16 machine learning uh, models. Each one is corresponding to a, a specific block size, and we can have output a vector of probability going from two to six according to the possible splits in the reference topic. And in this uh, figure, I try to uh, give the performance of our model represented in blue. Here we have the complexity reduction in percentage, so higher is better. And here we have the BD rate loss, uh, so lower is better. And our solution is represented in blue for four configuration according if you test only the top one uh, split or the top two or the top three or the top four splits by the encoder. As we can see, compared to the state of the art, we have uh, the highest uh, performance in both complexity reduction and bit rate loss uh, reduction. And, we, uh, and also we can perform like what we call a different trade-off of between complexity reduction and coding loss according to the top, the tested uh, splits by the encoder. And compared to this solution, for example, let's uh, use some handcrafted features to uh, perform the, the splits. We have 10% of gain in terms of complexity compared to before, and 1% of gain in terms of uh, bit rate reduction compared to uh, uh, the found C3. Now I present uh, the last contribution for conditional coding for learning based pre-compression. This is uh, the work of uh, Theo Ladwin with collaboration with, uh, with Orange. Uh, it is at, uh, in terms of level at uh, the learning based solution. And the objective is to leverage spatial and temporal correlation with end-to-end -end learning based progression approach. So this is the overall simplified scheme of uh, the proposed uh, system. So we have mainly two networks, MOFNET and CodecNet. Uh, so the MOFNET network takes as input the image we want to encode and two reference frame, previous and future, available at the level of the decoder. And it's, in, and it's predict motion vector corresponding to these two reference frames, and also a beta here, which is the weight between uh, these two, uh, the, the two reference frame constructed with the, these two motion vectors. And then we have here a motion compensation that takes into account the two reference frames and the motion vectors and the weighting parameters beta to construct here uh, the predicted frame and the code net uh, perform what we call conditional coding between the original frame and the, the predicted frame from the MOFNET to uh, encode and decode the decoded frame. So to summarize, the MOFNET takes as input two reference frames and the original frames and predict two motion vectors corresponding to two these reference frames and the weighting between these motion vectors. And then once we have this, we can perform a weighted B prediction with using this weighting parameters beta and one minus beta. And then the code net perform a conditional coding uh, that takes as input the original image and uh, the predicted image. So this model has been, uh, has been improved later with introducing this skip mode because uh, some, part of the, some part of the video doesn't need to, trans to transmit more residuals. So we just need to, uh, to use uh, the predicted frame 
directly to reconstruct in the reconstruction. So the main difference here is to add some part which is encoded without any uh, transmitting any residuals and how we can uh, find this part which is transmitted with the residuals and no residuals. The MOFNET predict another parameter which is alpha. So uh, alpha value multiplied by the original and the predicted are encoded with residuals and one minus alpha multiplied by uh, uh, here the predicted frame are, are directly copied to uh, the reconstructed frame are not are coded without sending more residuals. Here in these schemes we don't see the encoder and the decoder. This is just a more complex scheme but it's it so how we transmit uh, the bit stream for the MOFNET so it takes as input these three uh, images and transmit uh, the information that is used then to decode the two motion vectors, beta and alpha. And here we have the code net that also uh, show how we can send a bit stream from the encoder to the decoder to, uh, to reconstruct a video with a better quality, uh, with, the, with the performing conditional coding between XT and the predicted XT uh, field. And here we have the skip mode that uh, transmits directly uh, the predicted uh, frame to the decoder. Now, uh, this model has been optimized uh, the same as learning based solution by minimizing the, the weight between the distortion and the rate. Here, the only difference that we have the rate from for the motion part and the rate for the residual part. And here we use multi, multi scale MSSTM for the optimization. And this is giving some condition of the testing. And uh, we compared with HEVC uh, with HM16, which is the reference software, and also the fa it fast implementation X265 in medium and in also random access configuration. This figure gives uh, the performance of uh, our solution here in uh, yellow compared to HM in red and the X265 uh, also. As we can see here, our solution in yellow uh, performs uh, better than the fast implementation of HPC, X265. And it's also, uh, it is very competitive also with the HM implementation of, uh, uh, of HPC. And in blue, we have our sample model without any motion. In red, in green here, we have a sample model in Kaiser with motion and the, and the skip mode. You can see like we have uh, uh, the increase of each component from the blue one which is a simple model then the green one uh, which with the adding the motion uh, prediction and the skip mode and then with adding conditional coding we have even higher uh, performance uh, at, uh, especially at low bit rate now to compare our results with uh, uh, with respect to uh, fast implementation of HEVC here we give the gain of this of this uh, configuration: no motion, 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 and skip, motion, skip, and the uh, conditional coding, which is our solution. We can see, like uh, compared to the fast implementation of HEPC, we can have uh, 14.2 bitrate reduction, and we are also very competitive to HEVC, uh, which perform 18% uh, bitrate reduction compared to the fast implementation of uh, HEVC, and. Uh, yeah, here even with only skip uh, and the motion, we have we are uh, we perform five percent of the detection compared to the fast implementation of it. So this is the end of the contribution. So uh, I will present some future work. So limitation and opening according to the contribution. So for encoded complexity rejection, uh, we have seen some limitation. We have uh, because our solution was only for intra prediction. For intra, all intra mode. When we tested it on enter mode, we, we have a uh, highest uh, loss in term coding efficiency. So for this, we have to consider more information about motions. And we have also to take into consideration the complexity of the prediction, which is performed with the convolutional neural network and the machine learning. And the idea here is to, what we are uh, trying to do is to use uh, multitask learning uh, to uh, predict not only the partitioning, but also the intra prediction mode and the transform uh, and the transform uh, to uh, enable highest complexity reduction by uh, sharing uh, uh, the features extraction, uh, which will improve globally uh, the performance of the solution. 
for the learning based completion uh, what we have seen also that uh, our uh, this learning based solution which is also the case for all machine learning solutions we have uh, weak performance uh, on unseen data during the, the training so if you have some characteristic of video that has not been introduced during the training uh, we will have uh, less coding efficiency and to, to prevent from uh, this uh, issue we are trying to use continuous adaptation of the encoder and decoder weight during the training and uh, during the training and uh, during the testing set. And we have seen like also uh, this uh, motion prediction module have no accuracy of motions. So we have to consider more advanced motion estimation model. And we have to consider also more than two reference uh, frames. Uh, another limitation for this problems that we have a high number of parameters for the decoder is around uh, 20 million parameters and also if we perform encoding and decoding on different platforms we can have a drift uh, in terms of computing accuracy that can lead into a very low uh, video quality as we can see here and this problem can be uh, solved by using uh, integer uh, neural network and, uh, fi and finally, uh, I am also uh, have some interest on the uh, uh, coding of count code video, uh, for which this conventional hybrid approach is not optimized for 3D data with the uh, geometry information. And we are trying to investigate some graph transform and learning based solution to encode efficiently this data. And we are thinking also to combine uh, a coding, uh, which is improved with using uh, synthesis also at the decoder side. So this is the last part of uh, this presentation, which summarizes uh, my uh, teaching and uh, research activity. Uh, as we have seen, I have proposed uh, many new tools, uh, uh, several new courses during the last five years in machine learning, Python programming, and image processing. I am also uh, working on new course uh, for security in machine learning, data privacy, and deep fake. Uh, we, we want to propose to the master's cyber school in Iran. We are also uh, uh, working to provide more practical projects to uh, improve the education uh, by uh, skills to our students. And I, I, I lead also the project of uh, sponsorship of our uh, students for, uh, 2000, uh, uh, for 2024 by Harmony Company that sponsored uh, with uh, many actions between the students and the company. So for the research, as we have seen, we did the contribution at different level of video coding then. Uh, we have also, uh, this research enables also several openings to other fields like security and privacy in machine learning and media content. Science prediction, blind video quality assessment. Also, we have uh, some projects with uh, our partners. I co-organized several national and international workshops in this field and special session in conferences and journals. And as we have seen, we have a very rich collaboration with academic institutions in France, Europe, and also with industry partners. Uh, we have also uh, contributed to uh, projects of our industrial partners for software and hardware encoder and decoder. We designed two real-time software decoders, OpenHTC and OpenVDC for real-time decoding of compliant with these two standards, HTC and uh, VDC. And we have been one of the first in the world to uh, uh, do like a real-time demonstration from the encoding, the encoding Explorer 4K video with the uh, time encoder of our partners, which is encoded in live into the CDN, and our decoder with FFmpeg or uh, with the DPAC uh, player can uh, request stream in real time the video from the CDN. And uh, finally, uh, some uh, more exploration research topic I'm interested on, and uh, we have some working group on that for long term by, for long term by, by uh, 2030 is the code data storage on DNA. Uh, federated learning we are also used for uh, data privacy. Uh, we want also to develop some skills in graph neural networks, especially for the encoding of uh, 3D content and synthesis. And uh, finally, we have a group uh, in uh, RAN working on a future on quantum machine learning, perform uh, fast computing and also distributed uh, learning. So I give also uh, some references for this presentation and uh, thank you uh, for your attention. I'm ready to answer your questions.
thank you very much for this uh, very nice overview of your research activity. Um, so now it's time for questions. So we'll start as usual by the rapporteur. So I would like to start with Maria Martini. Are you still with us, Maria? Yes. Yes, I hope you can hear me. Yes. yes. I can still hear and hear, but it's uh, fine. So thank you for a very nice presentation, uh, which has been with a wide range of activities of high quality. So thank you for it. And uh, going back to the document that was uh, submitted, uh, this was also very important. Uh, CV clearly highlights uh, uh, high level of activity, many awards, and uh, uh, impactful results. So results that not only ended up in publications, but in uh, international projects and in relations with the uh, uh, industries, which is uh, very much appreciated. Uh, the documents, uh, also the results of the documents are all high quality, technically sound, and uh, uh, I do not have uh, major comments. I have some questions. I don't know if this is the time to ask questions or not, or if you have a general review before we ask questions later. How do you prefer to organize the session? Okay. Now you can ask uh, all the questions to, you want now. Oh, all right. Cool. Okay. Member of the jury for the question. So please ask for all your questions. I could not hear, but I understand I can ask some questions now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's go. Um, maybe. Okay, maybe I will start from the part on variable frame rate, which I found particularly interesting. Uh, since also related to something uh, we are doing. Um, so it is also presented, you produced a data set that I understand is the public one, right? Uh, is the data set made public, the data set that you mentioned? Yeah, actually, uh, for this data set, we use three data sets. Uh, from, uh, one is public, but the, but the two others are not public, like from Ecom and uh, Harmonic. For this reason, yeah. students made this data set uh, publicly av available for uh, so far, maybe okay. in the future. And the uh, subject is uh, associated to the content which is public. Uh, are these public as well? Or? Uh, for now, yeah, they are for uh, up to now, they are not, uh, we don't yet make, make data set public, okay. but in the future, maybe we can provide this uh, uh, information about the subjective evaluation. Okay, thank you. Uh, because this will be for the quality in general to test uh, uh, variable frame rate uh, strategy. Um, something I was wondering here reading this one. So, did you try to compare your strategy with uh, or maybe considering just uh, simple? indicators of the central complexity like the TI. So I see that you calculated the TI and SI for the differences. Uh, did you compare your methods with uh, the injunction? So not the classical definition of TI, which involves a maximum uh, across the sequence, but just the TI, the local TI, temporally local TI or different information, like just uh, uh, differences between frames or something very basic. So I think it would be nice to see a different in performance of what you have done with respect to these very basic approaches. Did you try and do it? Uh, yeah, our, our objective in this work was to uh, uh, compute uh, low complexity features but uh, complex uh, features that enable to uh, cover this uh, uh, temporal uh, motions in the video. And we can have, for example, two kinds of motions. The first one is like a camera moving or a big object moving in the, the video. And the other kind of motions, which is also uh, important, it is, can be like uh, some uh, local fast motions in the video. And uh, for this, uh, we use it, uh, uh, temporal features. 
The first one are motion vectors that uh, we extracted from a video encoding, for example, AVC at very fast uh, uh, preset. And uh, the second also, uh, uh, the second features we use it is uh, to compute the difference between two collocated uh, frames. And then from these uh, features, which are at the frame level, we uh, computed the mean, the variance, uh, uh, the mean over the top 10, for example, to cover both uh, global motions of the stand and uh, local uh, uh, and the local motion. And this uh, work have been uh, also uh, have been also implemented on real time by Victor and have been uh, showed at uh, different uh, workshops uh, like uh, uh, DV, for example. Uh, so it is really really uh, re working uh, on real time. Uh, of course, we can use uh, more uh, more advanced. Uh, features, uh, but at the cost of uh, maybe uh, complexity. So at this work, we try to keep uh, it uh, simple, but uh, working efficiently, as we have seen for different uh, uh, video with different uh, motion and uh, spatial characteristics. Okay, thank you. Yes, my question was uh, rather if you can see something, comparing this with something that is static. Like uh, just time for information, you know the TI that you calculated for the data set, right? For the data set, you have shown that you calculated uh, SI and TI parameters. So what happens if you just use TI and you check the correlation between TI and the need for higher or lower frame rate? Did you, did you test it or? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, for example, TI is uh, the difference between two adjacent frames. It is a uh, very really, uh, exactly. close. What we did as a yeah exactly. Uh, so what is the difference between what you did and something which is just this one? Yeah, it is uh, in terms of uh, principle is uh, very simple, and this is also what uh, used for example VMAP for uh, quality. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So in terms of performance, so my question is, uh, how do you think that estimating the need for higher or lower frame rate based on TI? or based on your strategy? What do you think is the difference in performance and the improvement of your strategy with respect to using just DI, for instance? Uh, I think, for, for example, uh, maybe I, if you take only uh, the mean information for uh, the frame, we are not able to... Uh, yeah, that's uh, why I mentioned the local TI, right? <laughs> Sorry, I think there is some delay in uh, the communication. Yeah. Uh, but if we consider like uh, uh, from the TI, if we consider other information like uh, uh, the top 10 maximum uh, uh, temporal information from all the pixels and uh, some statistical information, I think uh, this is what we did in this work. Uh, Yeah, so yeah, you had something more, right? Because you had some considerations of the motion vectors, and uh, but yes, they are related. That's why I wanted to better understand the difference, but that's okay. It's fine already. Um, we did also this uh, feature selection, so we considered like the first uh, features that have uh, the highest impact on the classification accuracy of our system. So, uh, so uh, in total, we computed more than these uh, features. But uh, in the final, we have like feature selection with using this uh, difference of information gain of each features. Uh, and we selected like the first, uh, yes, having yes. the highest impact on the classification. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Something else about uh, the data set. Uh, my understanding is the data set really includes natural video, is correct? Uh, it includes uh, 360 video for the training, yes. Yeah, and it doesn't include, I think, synthetic video, right? So how do you think this approach could generalize for, for instance, gaming videos? They're working on gaming videos, and do you think this approach could suit well for gaming videos or synthetic videos, or do you expect any issues with it? Uh, yeah, we haven't tested on uh, synthetic video because in this uh, work, we was uh, targeting a broadcast application, uh, but it would be very interesting to uh, see how it performs on uh, synthetic videos. Uh, I don't have a, 
good understanding on uh, the problems in Sensitix video, but uh, I don't know uh, what is the impact of uh, high motions uh, if uh, on code at uh, if uh, high frame rates brings uh, higher qualities in this uh, context or not. Uh, maybe this is the first question. Uh, and then we have to test uh, with this model uh, or improve our data sets with including some uh, uh, yeah, gaming, for example, synthesis uh, content high frame. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, I would have many questions, but probably in the interest of time, I would. Uh, ah, no, something, another question that I wanted to ask. I see that you use uh, BD rates for comparing different uh, approaches at some points. Uh, can I ask you which implementation you used uh, for the BD rates and how many operating points uh, you consider? Uh, yeah, usually we, uh, in our, uh... Uh, like in uh, our research, we try to rely on the common test conditions of the standard. So uh, usually we use uh, the four uh, that are defined in the CPC of uh, HEVC, if you use HEVC or BVC. So uh, the audio is wrong, but I heard the standard, right? So probably you use the version using the MPEG or? Uh, sorry, I don't hear you. Yeah, I could not hear you well either. So I was asking if you, I, I only heard the word standard. So did you use the version which is used in MPEG? Yes, we use the common test conditions from MPEG according to HEVC or BB. Okay, thank you. And how many operating points do you consider in your curves? Uh, we usually consider uh, four as the common test okay. conditions. Uh, in some specific cases and application where we need, for example, to assess the performance of our model at a very high pitch rate, for example. Uh, some uh, experiments uh, are uh, also defined in uh, standardization to test uh, a very low QP test, for example, when we, when we work on the transform approximation, to see like uh, still approximation uh, works at a very uh, high bit rates. So it depends on application, but in general, we use uh, four uh, for one like uh, QP, uh, 22, 26, 27, and uh, 30. Uh, oh, that's, that's good, thank you. That's, uh, of course, the right approach. We have done some studies recently on BD rates, and we noticed that when they're used with major operating points, so four is actually the number of points it was defined for, right? When it is used for many points, so the effects can be unexpected i say the results can be unexpected and not uh, probably fully correct so we have published something recently about it and was interested in uh, uh, asking how you, how you it. uh thank you okay i will probably stop here uh, but it was interesting i would have many questions and i also appreciate it i think it was also interesting the interest in the critical part that you had at the end. So it was a very critical overview of uh, uh, the results done and the challenges and potential of the research you, you had done. So thank you. It was a very good, uh, interesting reading. So the last part. Thank you, Maria. So we move to the second rapporteur, Professor Jenny Benoit. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. And first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to participate in this work. And uh, as you may know, I was a patient and more now than in coding, but still have some coding experience for the so, uh, so um, contributions numerous, and uh, probably I will not ask you all the questions I asked in my work. And uh, we will start um, with part three, chapter two. So here we propose to 
combine uh, the, let's say, the well-known register optimization for the encoding of <coughs> in mode with the look ahead behind the system, uh, which consists in video source analysis without an and um, two um, designs um, design a um, psychovisual adaptive right? And is the qualification to use structure clarity. While in psychovisual, let's say, coding application, we have some other, for instance, Weighted means where error preparing weight and R may please just file it. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, uh, in our proposed uh, model, uh, we have these uh, parameters that can use uh, whether uh, like mean square error uh, or introducing this more uh, type well, which corresponds to. Uh, the variance of uh, the block. And for the test set, we consider uh, the SNR and uh, SSCM. Uh, the reason is that uh, we want to have performance with the SNR, which is more related, which is used in uh, the community. And we also use uh, SSCM to show, like, use this uh, SQL visual function. We can uh, improve the performance in terms of PSNR, but uh, maybe the performance in terms of, uh, in terms of SSCM, but maybe the performance in terms of uh, PSNR may be lower. Uh, so to validate uh, this concept, we use uh, SSCM. Uh, but in our experiments, we, do, uh, we did both. Yes, but I am not about this. <clears throat> I'm speaking about other Psychological methods such as weighted MSP and weighted PSNR. So, uh, SCM it is very known, but in, we have other, and uh, I personally worked on weighted MSP, which was weighted by, you know, particular features which attract attention in the video frame. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, Ashishai, uh, uh developed uh, such a matrix, which is a weighted PSNR, that uh, <laughs> weights uh, the PSNR at uh, the physical levels. But uh, it's always uh, when we use the algorithm that uh, uh, maximize such criteria, and then we use the same criteria for the evaluation. So, of course, we can uh, say like there is gain which is totally good. But uh, if we want to validate this game, in reality, we have to perform strict evaluation uh, because there is no consensus uh, on uh, this uh, objective quality image. Maybe expert quality wouldn't uh, like to hear this, but uh, in the compression community, we rely on the PSNR because it's a uh, pixel one. If you have a shift or if you have uh, can have a high error, which uh, is most variable. And always, if we use uh, uh, metrics with weighting, and then we use it for evaluation, of course, we will have uh, uh, a gain because we are optimizing for this specific criteria. But for me to validate whatever the, what we use for coding and for testing, maybe the best way is to validate these improvements in terms of uh, subjective evaluation in like. Uh, uh, in like normative condition. Mm -hmm. And this requires, of course, dedicated, yeah. heavy psychovisual experience. Okay, thank you very much. Now, the second question is uh, my colleague already asked about uh, this uh, contribution, very not to adapt the frame rate. And this is actually a very old question in all the coding community, right? So, uh, yeah, several questions uh, here. Um, the first one is, I like your hierarchical decision 
true. But <clears throat> how did you choose this four frame camp? Have you considered some psychovisual parameters, such as the time of the case to the distorted? to the distorted area, or um, the time of initial observation of a video signal, which is around 200 milliseconds, and then we will perform full, full speed, for instance, if you have only one moving more object. Uh, how all this were taken into account when you proposed your four frame count? Uh, I think the idea was uh, using uh, four uh, frames chunk is uh, to have like a, a maximum adaptation you can have in the view, like uh, four chunks. And uh, even this, when we did subjective evaluation, we cannot exactly uh, know exactly that at this four frame there is a distortion or not. There is some approximation. Uh, with the experts that evaluated the sequences. So of course, uh, there is some approximation. And even if the, the results are not uh, perfect, because uh, even the ground truth is not uh, assessed perfectly. So uh, there is some approximation or from where distortion can start at the level of four frames. But at least when we encode in the article coding, we have uh, four levels. And we can perform this temporal scalability, and we can remove up to four frames. It is adapted without uh, changing uh, the coding and the decoding configuration. Uh, and since we have this minimum accuracy, in practice, we can apply it at the group level, group of pictures. We can apply it at the sequence level. We can apply it at uh, one second or two seconds, a uh, uh, different level of segmentation. But at least propose something which is uh, uh, very local in terms of temporality. And then it can be used at different levels. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And now the question is about your feature view. So I've read my report, and I was actually a little bit surprised that you used a single uh, frame difference, that you did not estimate motion, and that you did not reason on motion energy. Uh, we have motion vectors also, uh, like uh, the motion. Are uh, the arc motion pictures. First one is the difference between uh, and then we have a threshold holding, uh, but we use also motion information from uh, AV, uh, very fast encoding. And from this uh, motion map, at, uh, we computed several features, the standard deviation, mean, top 10. So we have uh, features from the motion. Not only the difference between adjustment. Okay. Uh, and also um, about the pack visual experiment here, because you uh, designed a double stimulated psychovisual experiment. And uh, for the years, uh, psychovisual coding community worked on non reference quality assessment metric because the, the reason is that. Uh, the, the user, the observer, does not have the original source video. It has only decoded video. So for this source, it has to keep his uh, opinion score, right? And still, you design two stimulus experiments. Please explain. Yeah, it depends on uh, uh, on the object. In uh, our objective, we want to say to say. If our variable frame rate provides exactly the same performance than the high frame rate. And the high frame rate is the original, right? So we have to assess both, uh, uh, both high frame rates and also uh, comparison with the uh, uh, variable frame rate because we want to check if our solution is as good as uh, the high frame rate. And this is our objective. But in other contexts, uh, we did also. Uh, uh, like a subjective test without the reference or with a high reference check, uh, like our best quality is close to the high reference. But it's depend, uh, it depends on, on the context uh, uh, of the objective or application. And this is the objective 
is to compare with the reference. So for this reason, we, uh, we tell to the observers what is the ideal quality we have. Uh, he has to know what is the ideal quality to say if our quality is, is equivalent or not. Oh, I understand a lot. Okay. Mm. And um, probably the last one is about uh, work. Mm -hmm. It is a general question, basically. Throughout your uh, classification approach, you are very keen on decision tree. And uh, basically, you find to kind of linear speed that will extract ad hoc as motion maps or motion vectors. Uh, if you try to compare with the uh, learning from graph data, why? Uh, you mean uh, learning based? Yes, yes. To use the network as a, from in, for instance, for this frame rate, uh, to use just a yeah. neural network. What from uh, road yeah, what we have noted uh, in this, not specifically maybe for the specific program, but what when we uh, learning based first, and uh, we do statistical tests, uh, we have a very high variance and instability of the results. And when we uh, handcraft features, even if they are simple, made with a lower uh, accuracy in the average, but they are more stable with a lower confidence interval. Uh, so sometimes, uh, and we observed this in actually quality evaluation, when we use uh, learning based feature extraction, can reach higher performance than handcraft. But in terms of statistical analysis, we don't have, uh, statistically, we cannot say that they are better than handcraft because even handcraft are lower, the confidence interval is very uh, low. And this is uh, very important consider because we want that our model works uh, on the NSIM data I more uh, they are more confident with handcraft features uh, than learning based or we have to compare uh, to combine both but uh, it's not always the case that uh, learning based features are uh, better maybe in average but in terms of uh, statistical analysis uh, they are not still uh, perfect okay thank you very much so thank you for your nice answer questions and patience once more. Very interesting. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, now the third rapporteur is Professor Monsef Gavush from Saint Pere University. Okay. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you for your nice presentation, uh, for the great work, and I hope you guys can hear me well. Um, mm -hmm. I traveled thousands of miles and kilometers to come here for slide number 63. <laughs> so if you want to put slide number 63 for the audience there to see, then we can have some nice discussion. And I'm not going to ask about any technical or say mathematical approach for uh, our audience. Because I want to take a little bit of a uh, bird eye view on this and ask you four questions. Only four. And the question can be long, but your answer very brief and very short. I don't expect you to take very long answers. And uh, the couple of things that interest me on that slide is the cold data storage on uh, DNA and the quantum uh, machine learning. So first question goes like this. Uh, for decades, engineers have been trying to solve the compression problem with great success. Some were short-lived, uh, yet they were great. So just looking at the Myriad of international standards, one can see great milestones and sometimes even great creativity. The fact remains that uh, for the major part, they have been somewhat incremental. One should admit, but fortunately, the more recent ones included some great jumps 
um, like the case of uh, scalable video coding or multi-view video coding or 3D uh, video coding, etc. They have been really, really great. Uh, and there is no incremental, there is at least a little bit more creative. Now, at the same time, we see other technicians and engineers designing cameras, optics, and integrated chips to capture millions, billions, billions, and perhaps in the future, zillions of pixels. Now, the problem with these is that their images and videos, they will come to you and to us. And we have to compress them for storage. So this race, larger bandwidth and more compression has been going on for decades. Now, here's a question. Where do you think it's going to go from here? Say in the next 10 or 20 years, you have put some very nice answers here. Starting after ICIP 2024, you will start working on some of these. Hopefully, maybe you can say something about what you wrote on that slide in relation to my question. Yeah. Uh, so, to answer this question, uh, like uh, three are generating the more and the more, more data. And uh, uh, for some reasons that can be uh, maybe administrative reasons, we have to save uh, this data. And this is we require few uh, like a uh, huge uh, like server to store them for decades. And uh, there is some theoretical work like showing that we can uh, store uh, all this data in uh, a size of the van if we consider this cold storage on DNS. And maybe uh, for all this data, uh, we don't have to uh, access to them uh, every day. So we just have to store them so that we know that they are. Uh, what can be encouraging is that we can store all this data in one event. So this is uh, good in terms of uh, carbon impact, uh, good for many reasons. But now, technically, it's very difficult. There is only uh, two works they are showing we can perform maybe uh, as good as the JPEG, as good as JPEG 2000. So there is a lot of uh, research, but uh, many countries, like for example in the US, they are putting many efforts at uh, different levels, not only on uh, algorithmic levels, they are even in the physics and all different levels. And uh, this maybe address a very important problem. Uh, and in France today, uh, there is a, uh, a consortium uh, that is working on this uh, topic with uh, Marc Antonini, who is leading this at Inria Davis. And I found this idea very interesting and can even combine it with the deep neural network also to perform, uh, because the problem in, in DNA is that we can have uh, many errors when we uh, write and delete data. And you can design like uh, systems like uh, John Bush panel coding, for example, with using uh, this uh, uh, deep neural networks, because now we can uh, perform, uh, for example, modulation coding in a wireless system with using this uh, neural networks. And they proposed a project in this uh, in this area. Uh, so now we are waiting for uh, the response, and we have a list for the answer. And we have some uh, contacts also with the India of Pan, India of uh, uh, East, to investigate this topic. Uh, of course, uh, we always want to have a return and income from just, and maybe this is a long time uh, for long term, but we have to put uh, effort on that because the other countries are doing uh, fast. I'm, I'm really happy to hear this, and, uh, and, and uh, there is a reason that you that slide. And you would have to come up with it in your head. Happy that you gave. Um, let's move on to my second question. So, uh, Dr. Hamidi, um, you are among the few in the community who fully engage in what we call end to end solutions for video compression, uh, from radio portion station all the way to real time implementation. You also showed in your presentation that you made a nice demo and put end to end demo. Uh, in the past, when we described compression algorithms with respect to complexity, we teach our students that the main challenge 
and the bottleneck lies within the estimation, motion estimation, motion computation module of the, of the project. Now, given the current trend in video compression, given the recent work, where is and where will the bottleneck reside in future projects? Again, seen as end-to-end -end system. Where are the, where is the challenge? Uh, for this end-to-end uh, system, uh, the challenge is at the level of uh, the hardware manufacturer. Uh, because uh, uh, this end-to-end -end learning based features, even if I give here 20 million parameters, is faster than DVC if we run it on GPU, because it's fully parallelized. Uh, so uh, this, uh, the community that are working on this uh, learning-based systems, uh, you know, this bit may be changed from the community who developed the, the conventional uh, standards. And they are pushing many efforts to uh, standardize this uh, learning-based uh, systems. And so, yeah, to answer the question about the complexity, Tomorrow we have uh, uh, a GPU that can fit in mobiles. I think uh, we can uh, use uh, these uh, systems. Uh, there are some technical parts that we have to solve, for example, using bigger, uh, bigger neural networks to perform accurate computing from the encoder to the decoder, uh, or uh, also to solve this problem of uh, adaptation to the content because we cannot train the model. Uh, on a very uh, large data sets, or we want to have uh, small models, but that can adapt. Uh, but I think the, the, the answer is at the level of the hardware, and maybe GPUs manufacturers uh, have advantage at this level compared to a manufacturer in, uh, for example, FPGA, uh, with uh, are less compatible maybe to this architecture uh, because um, we have many parameters we have to take them. I, I totally agree with your answer, and I think the hardware guys will come back to us and say, hey, you designed these complex problems and uh, algorithms for us, and uh, we deal with them in the best way we can, but uh, they, they may throw the ball back to us to file to the complex. But, but that's a, I agree. Uh, let me move to my third question that has two parts. Uh, bear with me. This um, in your publication, the IEEE Transaction Service System for Video Technology, one of them, uh, you developed a visual attention aware high dynamic range quantization for HD, uh, which establishes an important link between machine learning, not only not the only one, but at least one of them, an important link between machine learning and video compression, and opens new horizon for future development. Something that I included in my report and action. Now, this is not obviously the only link between machine learning and compression, uh, but it is an important one. So I want to pick your mind a little bit and explore two tracks. First one is uh, about supervised learning in machine learning that relies on data, lots of data. Machine learning tries to capture the underlying model and subtle patterns in the data that are relevant for the compression. Earlier systems used model-based analysis, starting with physics-based all the way to statistical model, uh, tried and succeeded in solving the compression problem. Now, should we just let machine learning discover the hidden model from the data, from the raw data, or would it be clever to guide the machine learning with known statistical models which have proven to work well in the past. Yes, yeah, to uh, answer this uh, question. Uh, and it's not tricky. It's, it's really, I just want to pick your mind on, on this. Yeah, this is a very, think. very important question. But uh, the answer is that uh, even if you rely on data playing the model, at the end, you find that the learning-based model did something similar to what uh, do the models that we have developed for 20 years. Statistically, for example. Like uh, we have, for example, Gabor Peter or uh, uh, transform, uh, transform. And actually what this photo encoder are doing, they are doing something, uh, they are learning, they are converging to something similar to what they did in the past. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know in which way we have to take it, but uh, at least from the training, we can say like models are converging that uh, what we did with traditional models that have been developed for this. So that's in, in itself is, is good news, but it's also hopefully something that we can build upon. And uh, in, in other works that we have been doing, my group, we uh, discovered that it helps quite a lot to feed in known uh, engineered features or statistical features or physics based, physical phenomena based models to the system, to the machine learning, and it helps quite a lot. So let me take my second uh, part of question three. So in this second part, in the second pack of question three, I want to look back to my first question, I hope you still remember it, now slide number three here. Uh, machine learning needs and uses enormous amounts of data and day books to tune a gigantic set of parameters. You mentioned in one of your slide 20 million parameters or so. While the human visual system is not capable of assimilating some of the details, making them kind of use this and not only use this, but they, as you said, they consume scarce energy. They are there, nobody's using them. In fact, um, if I may quote John Serra, right, he wrote in his book, Mathematical Morphology, many, many years ago, he said in the introduction that we see in an image what we want. So seeing an image or a video, we see what we want to see, meaning that the rest is not that important for us. Luckily, we are all different, and we need to retain many details, just, just in case somebody is that. So the main question is, do, do we actually need a billion, billion, billion pixels, or should we have, should we be doing a little bit clever work, clever design instead, uh, for instance, uh, using other more efficient schemes like compressive sensing or object-based capturing? Uh, yes, uh, it depends on the objective we have. For example, uh, when we work on the standardization, we went over our source uh, uh, with fidelity. So uh, we don't go further about uh, how the human like can look to uh, this content. We just want to be the most available to this content. And this may be very important when we transmit, for example, the data that uh, we know that answers to this what we want to receive. It doesn't introduce uh, uh, art, maybe artifact or even something make it uh, uh, better quality, but different from the source. And uh, so far, the standardization focus on the fidelity to the source. But uh, the community, for example, with the uh, uh, learning based, they developed with, uh, for example, generative neural networks, some solution that uh, when you look to the video or the image, it looks uh, very high quality, even better than the source, but different from the source. So it depends if the community accepts this or not. Some industrial, for example, say, uh, uh, I'm worried about this solution because uh, when it was me to uh, use, I don't to have the same fidelity as the source, but maybe there are other uh, applications, and uh, uh, if this uh, solution can use synthetic to the battery energy, it can be uh, uh, useful in the in, in fact. Uh, th thanks for sharing that view with me. Uh, this is very important, and I, I, I would go to that as well. So my final question is um, regards uh, the link between research and university. So the link between neuroscience, visual cortex, and the compression world has been evident for many years. Yet each discipline remains kind of independently thought in major research. My question for you, all this here, when will they be jointly exploited in a standard university course under the same so that we can help students? Yeah, this is uh, really important. We are always uh, uh, also asking. And uh, in our courses, for example, we are uh, trying to have a different kind of uh, courses, not only uh, technical related to computer science or signal processing. And the students have uh, uh, all 
several uh, courses from different uh, disciplines. And we are encouraging also students to follow, uh, uh, so for example, masters or two or courses in parallel to have this uh, skill. Uh, so always we are uh, 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 we are uh, like uh, teaching, giving courses uh, to the students. Work later on the society or in university in industry. So we have to listen to the what are uh, the needs we have and uh, adapt uh, like education to have a, a better society. Uh, so all these questions are very important, and uh, we are moving uh, according to our uh, uh, skill and uh, resources we have uh, to reach uh, this objective. So we hope the message will uh, pass through the right. Thank you so much for uh, the answers and patience. Thank you, Monsieur. So we now move to the examiners. So I start with Jens Tenerko, professor at Aachen University. Jens, are you here? Yes. Uh, there's still this feedback coming, so I'm hearing myself. Echo later. I hope I can talk a little this, and I hope you you can understand me well. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, let me start with a question that I saw in your uh, topic. I saw in your thesis, but you didn't talk much about this. Is this temporal distortion propagation model? So. Um, and this is somehow I understand also related to, to uh, some sections later, you have this uh, uh, approach of look ahead coding and skip uh, probability. So your analysis is probably correct uh, that the skip mode is more frequently used if you increase the QP, that is an, an old story. But on the other hand, if you always use skip mode, it doesn't help either, right? So um, if you always use skip, you get nothing. That is why uh, the rate distortion behavior completely breaks down at some at some point. Yeah. Now, um, how do you how do you manage it? How, how do you decide to look ahead coding in which places to really rate and in which places to use skip? That is the real trick, I think. This is what I not fully understood. From what you have can you somehow comment on that yeah in uh, in this uh, rate distortion optimization uh, model uh, like uh, we want to like we want to model like uh, the propagation of uh, uh, component component distortion in the in the growth and uh, like the previous model that has been uh, proposed doesn't take into consideration this kick uh, mode where we don't uh, transmit uh, residual the error is based only on the difference with uh, the reference, uh, the, the predicted plot. And what we try to do in this work is to have a more accurate uh, distortion propagation with integrating this uh, mode that can be used at a low bit rate to have a more accurate model and which is also uh, 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 validated in practice that uh, our model uh, fellows like the distribution of uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, statistics of the of the data we have seen uh, by doing some uh, test recording. So the idea is to uh, have more accurate model, uh, to have a more accurate uh, 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 derivation of the quantization parameter that takes into account this key code that have been uh, introduced in each unit. Okay, uh, so so which kind of frame uh, uh, are you using? Is it, is it a kind of random test mode or a temporal hierarchy, or what is it? Uh, yeah, here we focus on uh, random access uh, configuration. Uh, but uh, uh, still, the model uh, we use, for example, in uh, look at is uh, is uh, uh, somehow simple. So we don't do all the so we don't do all the partitioning. We just do uh, like a uniform partitioning in the of 16 by 16. Uh, so it is not, uh, uh, it's not, there is a jerry between. Uh, 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 so uh, from, from, from what, what I have read. So, uh, and that's of course the, the key factor because you would uh, put 
more quality into content that is good for prediction of upcoming content, right? This is also why, for example, the uh, common test conditions are using lower QP for the eye pictures and for the low uh, for the low levels of the temporal hierarchy. That's that's without that. It, so that, that way, only a small amount of bitrate goes into the last level of B pictures. Yeah, actually, okay. Uh, actually, when we consider like uh, the delta Q used in the go, uh, even if it was uh, optimized by ten by doing some tests. But uh, it compares to a very competitive coding configuration. Mm -hmm. uh, and from this point came all the difficulty to have something uh, adaptive in the uh, real time encoders. And also, even in the learning based coding, uh, uh, this uh, random access configuration is very challenging to achieve according to this optimization that have been uh, introduced in the reference software with using adaptive to the uh, have you alternatively considered making the QP uh, the adaptation uh, sequence limit? Because that could also work. There are some sequences uh, which are not changing much temporarily. In that case, you could even do more aggressive uh, good quality for the for the low levels of hierarchy. And there are others which are changing quickly. For example, if, if you permanently switch to intracoding, the whole QP. Uh, changing over the temporal pyramid that, that does not help. Yeah. That's an alternative that you could have considered. Okay, let me move on to the second. I'm, I'm going back to the high frame rate. Um, can you can you show slide 35 again? Uh, that was about the gains, the bitrate saving. Got there. So, um, 35, yeah. Yeah, that, that one, that one, that one. Uh, is this based on uh, Biontegard or is this, how, how did you determine that bitrate saving? Yeah, this is uh, a little bit, there is a little bit uh, some uh, assumption here. Uh, based on, uh, it is used uh, using uh, Biontegard, but okay. we suppose that we have the same PSNR. Uh, because we suppose that our algorithm doesn't uh, decrease Objective quality. But but how do you compute the PSR for the frame uh, Actually, uh, this is a little bit uh, trick. Since we have uh, validated here that we don't have any loss uh, subjectively, uh, we use actually the same PSNR uh, after frame dissemination and before. Uh, okay, it's but not, okay. Yeah. It's not uh, Correct, but based on the assumption that our model doesn't mm. introduce mm. any uh, visual distortion. Yeah, yeah okay, but, but uh, of course, in, in some narrow, in narrow way of savings, it's of course extremely uh, questionable to 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 base it on subject to quality because subject to quality always always having some inaccuracy in yeah. terms because of yes. etc. Yeah, because the PSNR yeah. is computed on that, it uh, it will decrease the quality because we are replacing yeah. the frame. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but now is my second question. If you go uh, to slide thirty three, uh, I I saw that there is a extreme quick variation of frame rates. Sometimes switching very quickly to sixty to twenty, etc. So uh, is that good to do so? Uh, and, and, and is it at all, how, how does a decoder implement that? Because a confounded decoder receives in the uh, second it's its frame rate, and then it always has to decode by that frame rate. So how can the poor decoder do that? Uh, actually, in the random access configuration, we have a component scalability uh, that we can remove the frames, and the decoder can decode it without any problem. Okay, that's what I was wondering to ask. Do you use temporal scalability? On the other hand, it's not a conformant decoder anymore, right? Because even in temporal scalability, a conformant decoder, according to the standard, would still have to decode everything. Uh, the decoder uh, uh, will not receive uh, the bit stream corresponding to this frame. So continue the decoding. Uh, it can be considered as lost the frame. 
but I think now there are some uh, uh, um, SEI messages that can uh, yeah. report for example, the duration of each frame to display it for longer time and uh, address this uh, problem. Yeah, that's what I understand. Uh, uh, green, green video and green metadata and, and all that stuff. It was always clear to me that a decoder is not a conformant one. Like in like in data losses, there's no 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 decoder conformance of what the decoder has to do with this data losses. It simply does some best effort on it. Right? But uh, here. We we don't have propagation of error to other frames sure. because we remove uh, uh, frames from the highest temporal layer. Yeah. Uh, just the decoder doesn't output some frames. I yeah. don't know if you can consider it as a confident or not in this case yeah. because the uh, the pixels are exactly the same uh, for other frames and some frames are not displayed. Yeah, so, uh, so you, you make uh, probably frame repetition. That's all you can, can do in that case, right? Because otherwise, if you do some more more uh, sophisticated interpolation of the missing frames, then uh, you don't save much in terms of the uh, of the of the uh, decoder complexity, right? Yeah, complexity. Yeah. yeah so, so the, what you could do is just doing frame, frame repetition. Uh, this is what we did for complexity reason of the decoder side because yeah, yeah. the interpolation model with using machine learning are, uh, are very very complex. And that's also also why uh, I was wondering if it is to, to switch forth and back. It would not, not be better to to just do it all the time for a certain sequence. And some sequences are sufficient to have sixty frames per second. For others, you really need the one hundred twenty. So that's, Okay, um, that was my second question. And, and now the third one about uh, something I did not see in your thesis. I, I, I saw that you, that you uh, in the conclusion, you said something on learning-based coding, but now you, you really have some ideas. If you can, can go to the 51, um, that was, uh, yeah, yeah, that one. So I understand if alpha is equal to zero, then you basically have something like, you're just using the, the prediction for the reconstruction, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, and, uh, but in that case, you would not, the codec net would not transmit any data, right? Yes. But how do you, how do you manage that? Uh, now, if alpha is something between and I, I would guess alpha needs to be uh, adapted locally, right? Yeah, alpha it is predicted by the MoveNet and this take value from zero to one. Yeah, but it is, is, it, is it locally or is it global? One picture. Yeah, pixel wise. Pixel wise. Pixel wise. Okay. But but then uh, the codec net. If if uh, if alpha is equal to one, it should send all information and, and a large amount of bit alpha is equal to zero, it should not send anything. How, how do you manage that to, to, to send the right amount of codec net? Yeah, it is like a rate distortion optimization. For example, if alpha is equal to zero, uh, all the input uh, here will be zero and the codec net with okay. the arithmetic encoder and arithmetic decoder oh, okay. will be very efficiently. Now I understand since, since uh, the red part uh, above the codec net receives nothing, then it does not send. Okay, I see. And now uh, I think on the slide 52, um, maybe it was too quick. But, uh, I was wondering uh, where do I see the loop? It must be a, a looped. Uh, approach, right? Otherwise, you would have drift between yeah, encoder so, and decoder. Uh, yeah, uh, here, uh, this uh, reference frames yeah. come from the decoded one here. Oh, okay. So the, the encoder also operates a decoder? Yeah, uh, uh, here the, uh, the the name of encoder is right. Like we are, uh, it's like uh, in the HEVC, this is the purely encoder. But 
of course, the encoder will have the decoder also to uh, decode this reference frame. Yeah. Uh, the frame, uh, yeah. Uh, the, 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 uh, the encoder is all this uh, thing, not only the, the red one, but the purely encoder is the red one. Okay. And and the net or how did you call that? Uh, that is uh, responsible for the motion estimation or. Yeah, the MoFNet is responsible only for the motion of estimation. So uh, we have, uh, so it takes as input uh, the fixed, uh, the image we want to encode, and it takes also as input the two reference, the previous and the future. And, 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 and how good is that in terms of the motion estimation? Yeah, this is one of uh, uh, one of the challenges for this uh, learning based. It's enabled to perform competitive uh, performance uh, on the Click 2021 uh, data set. Yeah. But if we have some uh, uh, specific motions, for example, fast motions, uh, it is not accurate. Uh, and uh, here we can have improvement to uh, reach, for example, DVC or whatever. Uh, uh, we have to, for example, have models that are more complex to uh, cover better this uh, motion estimation because mm -hmm. motion is not uh, is not as good as we can do in DVC, for example. Yeah. But uh, some, some people who are doing similar work, uh, including, for example, Johannes Ballet and his colleagues at Google, uh, they just use a decent optical flow algorithm and, and feed that information into the into the network. And that seems to work. Uh, yes, uh, in our objectives, uh, we wanted to uh, learn a model end to end from scratch yeah. without using yeah. some priors uh, uh, from advanced uh, motion, uh, motion uh, estimation. Because uh, here, the optimization is the right distortion. For example, the accuracy of motions, if it is uh, at the high cost of uh, transmission, maybe we don't, uh, uh, we don't, it is not efficient in terms of rate distortion. But uh, there is a limitation in terms of uh, models. Yeah. And uh, all the models from Google, for example, uh, usually they focus on uh, low delay configuration, low delay feed. So they use only previous frame. Maybe for this, they work uh, better. Here we are in random access configuration. We use two reference frames. It's yeah. more uh, complex. OK, well, on the other end, uh, you could, of course, ask, uh, what does end-to-end -end mean? Uh, for example, if I have available a video and a depth map, would I make the dogma that end-to-end -end only means giving the encoder a video, or would I also give it a depth map? And to me, a motion map seems very similar to a depth map if I have a, some decent way of getting it, right? Anyway. Yeah, yeah it depends on... And, uh, yeah. And, and typically, those people encode the motion map also with a with a uh, auto encoder, similar as the. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah, here even motion are encoded with this uh, auto encoder, mm. but we don't encode the motion. We uh, predict the motion. That, so this auto encoder do both coding and prediction of motion, uh, which is different from uh, giving the motions to the auto encoder that encode them. Okay. As you can see, the input, the input here is not motion. It's uh, the current picture and the reference picture. And the output is uh, motion vectors. So uh, this is uh, like the model that is doing both motion prediction and motion coding according to this rate distortion optimization. Yeah, but the, the decoder does not have the current picture available, right? So. Decoder has only the references available and the bit stream from uh, if we need more residual for motion vector is transmitted yeah. through, through this one. Mm -hmm. But we found that it is useful to uh, have some uh, features from reference frames that are available at the decoder that are concatenated with the bit stream transmitted by the encoder to have a better motion compensation. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we would say this is not useful because it is already here by the encoder. But we found that using it at decoder with another uh, shortcut uh, encoder, it's uh, it's helpful, and we don't have to transmit any bit stream. And we do also the same for this uh, uh, part of residual. Mm, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jens. So Thank you. Now.
move to the questions of Frédéric Dufour, who is Director of Research at PNRI. Thank you, Mrs. Pagina. I assume I will join what the other members of the jury have said before. You made a, uh, an impressive amount of work. And uh, actually, what's in your manuscript is a subset of what you have done and what you presented. Uh, you have done many other things with many, many interesting contributions. So uh, I want to congratulate you uh, for that. Um, now, going to, to some questions, and there have been already many questions. I will uh, try to address a few uh, directions which have not been discussed yet. Um, my first one is at the beginning, you show a, a slide where you, you show the progression of uh, AVC, HEVC, BVC, uh, gaining 50% each way compared to the other one of the same quality um, with an increase of complexity. Um, based on the same paradigm of uh, hybrid video coding. Well, this has been working pretty well for several decades, but have we reached the end of the road with this approach or should we continue with uh, more modes, more partitioning, more, I don't know what, <laughs> or we should move to something else? Uh, it's, it depends on uh, uh, if you are at the academic side or uh, industrial side. Like uh, today, industry are uh, uh, still uh, working on the future exploration of the future standard by 2025. And there is, I think, uh, now around 17% uh, or, uh, or 20, maybe, between 15 and 20% bitrate gain compared to VVC, still uh, uh, there, with using the same, uh, 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 same hybrid uh, video coding standard. And I think this. Uh, uh, these actors will put more effort to try to reach this uh, 40 to 50 percent. Of course, uh, the gain versus the complexity uh, becomes very challenging uh, today. Uh, and it is showed here. For example, for uh, HM, we have uh, only slight uh, increase in complexity compared to ABC, but for VVC, it is uh, uh, eight times more complex than, uh, than HEVC. Uh, and uh, for example, if we implement hardware encoder of BBC, we implement only a subset of the tools that have been addressed in uh, the standard, but at the same time, uh, also uh, uh, like the industry of uh, semiconductor is, uh, uh, is becoming more uh, efficient, so we can perform a more computation. So uh, we will see uh, the results in uh, maybe uh, one, one year, we are able to increase this coding efficiency to show that there is an evidence to develop future uh, standard. But uh, I think uh, part, uh, like the actor are trying to uh, cover all uh, possibilities uh, before uh, trying to investigate more uh, learning based uh, solutions. And now if we, if we go to, your learning scheme, so for instance, the, the slide 51 that you had before, slide 50. In this architecture, um, which it, it is trail end to end, but you still make the, the assumption that you want a paradigm with a motion estimation, compensation, prediction, and coding and residual. So you make some assumptions on that. Um, why did you make this choice and not uh, having really a uh, X as input, a big network, and the network really learn what it should do. Yeah, I think uh, uh, this uh, intuition uh, uh, compared to previous work, there are some previous work that tried to encode uh, the sequence with, the, for example, 3D convolutional neural network. But uh, the results was not as good as uh, can expect and the complex. And as uh, uh, we said uh, just before, the intuition behind this uh, three decades or four decades of scheme uh, is maybe good because uh, following this intuition, we are able to, uh, in uh, three years, because we started to work on learning based coding in 2019, to reach the performance of HPC that has is the effort for more than three decades. Uh, 
So this is just to support this intuition and all others, uh, because this is one way to consider this problem. There are many other ways to do this uh, motion prediction as Google do, for example, use, using a motion estimation model from different data sets. Uh, but uh, they don't, I think, uh, reach this uh, level of coding efficiency. And uh, this model, for example, it was the won the challenge of Big Click 2021 in this category of learning-based intuition. Uh, so uh, this intuition, it came from, uh, was compared to other uh, solutions that try to encode directly a uh, sequence of video with using a uh, TV computational network or other. Um, on this game, I have also a minor question. I, I may have missed, but you X, it, in which color space is it, is it RGB or YCBCR? Uh, here we should uh, work on uh, uh, RGB or uh, YUV in 444. Four. Uh, what is good in learning based, uh, for example, in uh, conventional codex, we have to uh, do this uh, transformation from 444 four, four to 420. But uh, in this learning, we can provide the network with the 444 four and manage to uh, be correlate if there is correlation uh, there. So the performance, if you use RGB or YUV, does it make a difference? Uh, there are some uh, studies, I think, uh, by Qualcomm. They tried to say, like, uh, if we help uh, this uh, learning-based encoder with using this uh, subsampling to 40, can gain uh, some percent in terms of uh, bit rate uh, reduction. But I think with this such this approach, don't see uh, maybe uh, this uh, amplification. Maybe the network can learn directly to uh, to compensate it with the. the okay. um, in well, in the scheme of ballet or what you are using, you have a paradigm of using an auto encoder with a goal of having. Uh, fidelity criterion and in trying to produce uh, the input. But as was discussed before, uh, and you could try to relax this fidelity and try to have uh, an aesthetic uh, output. Um, and maybe instead of having auto encoders, having GANs to do that, uh, that's something you have looked at. Or? I think uh, Google have uh, explored this uh, topic uh, in, the, in the past, and they show like with using a generative adversarial network and have a better performance in terms of visual quality of the image. Uh, but of course, if you optimize perceptual quality, uh, we always will have uh, something better, but it's uh, uh, difficult to compare with the such approaches. And uh, our objective in this work, we try to uh, have the same uh, uh, like uh, comparison as we did with uh, this uh, hybrid video coding standard with uh, having the fidelity because it is uh, challenging and we have what is the upper branch now. For example, it is the VVC that we want to reach, uh, but in the, uh, and we are not there. We are just uh, the same level than HEVC. So we have to uh, make improvement to reach, for example, VVC. And then, of course, can this uh, models can be explored to uh, use different perceptual. Yeah, and one of the one of the actually the, one of the advantages of this uh, architecture is that it is uh, can use any perceptual metric as far it is differentiable, uh, and this is one advantage of this uh, uh, codec. Like for example, we can replace uh, here we use for example MS 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 yeah? We can replace it with other perceptual metrics since it is differentiable. We can get the quality uh, corresponding. This is uh, an advantage for this uh, of approach. But we didn't investigate uh, this topic. It was investigated very well by uh, for image and also video. Right? Um, in your manuscript, you also mentioned to use the vision transformer. Uh, for coding. Uh, so I'm not an expert in vision transformer. Can you explain a few words how you see this 
to be applied for cooling? Yeah, uh, uh, a vision transformer has been uh, adopted, for example, for uh, has been adopted for uh, synthesis. And uh, the idea here is to uh, use a vision transformer for uh, uh, prediction. Uh, for example, uh, prediction of the reference frame, or to do uh, synthesis after the decoding to improve the quality for a super resolution. It was uh, proposed in this way, and maybe the advantage uh, with using transformer uh, uh, compared to convolutional neural networks, we can take into account uh, the relation between different patches, which are from different regions of the image. This was an idea I wanted to investigate uh, for the coding, but uh, I was a little bit uh, discouraged by the complexity of uh, training this model and, of, of course, to then uh, motivate the complexity of the transformer. Um, maybe my last question on uh, a slightly different topic. You, you mentioned also non conventional image and video content. You mentioned the 360 videos, light field, point cloud, holography. Uh, in your view, what's, what's the most promising? Which way we should go? Yeah, uh, uh, in the past, we worked on the uh, light field, uh, narrow uh, baseline light field uh, with using uh, PANIP2 cameras to encode them. Uh, it was quite interesting. We combined the coding with synthesis because we encode only some uh, views and we synthesize the other views. And since we are in the narrow uh, baseline and synthesize the views with a really good quality. Uh, but uh, the application of this uh, light field, at least for a narrow uh, uh, baseline, it is maybe limited. Uh, there are more challenges maybe with using uh, uh, different uh, cameras uh, with a large baseline uh, light field uh, image and video. Uh, maybe it's interesting in terms of application more than but uh, Pound Cloud has attracted also a uh, lot of interest for, uh, from industrial in many applications. For example, in uh, 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 communication uh, or with cars for autonomy, autonomous uh, driving. And uh, I haven't worked on the Pound Cloud, uh, but uh, they have opportunity to investigate this. Maybe it is uh, promising in terms of application and also in terms of uh, challenging. Uh, to encode the geometry and the colors, even if there are uh, two standards that have been already developed by, uh, uh, by MPEG, but there is still a contribution we can uh, have. Uh, for uh, Rugati, it's more uh, maybe a uh, long term. Uh, this is my vision. Uh, okay, thank you. I will stop here. So, congratulations again for this uh, very large and very interesting amount of. Thank you, Frédéric. Yes, indeed, it's quite impressive the amount of work and the spectrum of work to so activities that you've covered with research and with all the uh, contracts and administrative duties that you, you have in parallel. Quite, quite impressive. Congratulations for, for that. Um, also, your, your document is really about a very nice, uh, nicely written, it's very synthetic. So, I think it's a useful document for, for yes, knowledge. Uh, so I had a number of questions, but unfortunately, when you come at the end, so unfortunately or fortunately, uh, fortunately, because it means that uh, they were not that stupid, because some other people have thought about them, <laughs> but then you're left with not that many questions to ask. But anyway, so also uh, slide 63, please. Um, so I did not travel as many miles as concept to see that slide there so there's only one mic but, <laughs> but it remains interesting for me uh, nevertheless so looking at that slide and it may be also connected to, to one of the questions of Frederic uh, so, uh, so I understand that that's your own agenda uh, some some topics that you would like to, to work on my wish list yeah what I yeah, want your to wish list your <laughs> wish list okay and uh, I was surprised not to see anything related to image and video compression in your wish list. So does it mean does it mean that there is no future in your in your head? Uh, I, I mean, in your I, your opinion about research in the image and video compression? So we are done. With that? That's it's connected to a question of Federico. Like for uh, image and video compression, 
like uh, uh, I gave uh, in the work some uh, short uh, short term perspective that we are uh, working on, and we have the work uh, on progress. We will continue working on that till there is uh, uh, interest from uh, research community, from the society, from also. Uh, but the community is uh, compared to other community, uh, other topics, and uh, also in terms of uh, uh, as the researcher go abroad and further. Uh, it is interesting to investigate uh, something for uh, is our role as a researcher. I said to investigate uh, such topics because there is no uh, maybe for now less interest from industry or from research. Even if there is uh, still interest from uh, other countries that are investigating this topic, yeah, this is just the reason because uh, for video we are uh, we having uh, currently many projects, having many PhD work, collaboration, uh, funding, so there is no problem on this topic. But uh, these topics we are, which are more exploratory for the future, uh, more difficult to get funding, and we have to spend also on time on this topic, but. Uh, in terms of research, it's very interesting and even publish in good journals conferences. So, as an academic, we have the chance to investigate this. So, in one of the points I was so raised by, uh, by Montef, uh, there was some issue of the amount of data needed to train or uh, machine learning, but uh, the deep model. But in, in deep learning, there is also this uh, research direction about frugality. So, so I'm, I'm not, not, I'm a, not that I'm surprised not that you're here because that's your right to have your own agenda, of course, or your own wish list. But, but what do you think about this? Because there are also activities on two shot learning, on uh, meta learning, maybe, which would be helpful for that, or transfer learning, which could possibly be helpful for that. Uh, who make this learning more frugal? Uh, what do you think about that? Would that be interesting, relevant for compression uh, applications? Yeah, I, or... think, uh, I think it's interesting because uh, a lot of people are trying to uh, investigate uh, these uh, topics. But I don't, I'm not expert okay, uh, in this topic. But if we talk about short learning, just transfer learning, is not enough in terms of uh, in terms of uh, value research. And uh, I saw a project uh, from uh, I reviewed the project like uh, uh, trying to use only the data uh, to learn the model, uh, and we use cluster learning, and uh, we have many data available. I don't think that's when we have uh, the data available that it is actually. My opinion of you, maybe there is frugality there. But in terms of, uh, for example, medical imaging, for example, where we don't have access to a large uh, set of data, this is a very important uh, topic to investigate. So I was like uh, working on this uh, medical imaging. Of course, I will investigate this because it is very interesting. Uh, we really need it. But investigating the topics where we have data, Maybe it's good to show some evidence because it can be used for other domains. Uh, but uh, for me, it wasn't a priority since they are well investigated by others. And for, reason, for this reason, I don't speak here because I, I heard a lot about this. But at my point of view, uh, this is my point of view. Of course, I can be wrong or not, but uh, this is my point of view. But in, uh, we worked on uh, uh, medical imaging with a colleague at uh, um, Munich. When we try to learn transformer with only this is in the future learning, I think it's really interesting. Uh, but in the domain where we have data, I saw projects uh, working with uh, West France, uh, having data and try to do frugality. Small at my point, too, I try to put effort on the other. Uh, okay. And uh, so, so I find I find the topic on the related DNA uh, also interesting. Um, so the compared to image or video compression, because here it's also sequences that you try to compress, but they have 
has to be almost uh, lost less or quasi lost. You mentioned the issue of robustness, so you mentioned joint source yeah. and algorithm. So uh, can can we uh, transfer some method from image to to the sequence of uh, yeah, usually uh, in this uh, DNA product, uh, we have uh, problems. Uh, the first one is to uh, fast access to the data since it is recorded. Second one is the error in writing and reading. And uh, third one is also in terms of uh, uh, capacity of coding. And for this uh, third problem, you can investigate all uh, this learning based solution. For example, uh, Instead of coding the image directly in DNN, we have uh, to encode only the latent space uh, after uh, arithmetic encoding. But we have to add some uh, redundancies to uh, recover from the error of reading and writing. Uh, so it is uh, really important to use uh, this knowledge about the source coding and channel coding uh, to address and the learning space to address uh, this problem. And of course, there are uh, it's uh, like multidisciplinary uh, uh, project. Like uh, we need materials from uh, physician uh, work on this topic also. Just then, how to when. But later. And when you mention uh, the other topic, when you mention security and privacy in machine learning, it's independent of compression uh, data compression. Like something in more general that you want to address. Uh, actually, um, what I like to do is, for example. Uh, Federated learning is a problem of, uh, for example, in medical institution, we don't, uh, cannot share the data. So the idea is to, uh, to train uh, local models and then send not the data, but the models to uh, aggregation, to aggregate them, to data center, to aggregate them, to have the model train it on uh, uh, IDD and not IDD data. That works uh, good for this problem. Uh, we have investigated this and have uh, published some papers on that. And this gives us idea to apply them in uh, our domain. For example, for quality evaluation, we can use it because sometimes we uh, want to um, evaluate the quality and develop the model, but maybe people does not want to share their uh, pictures or share their opinions. But it can be used in this way. And in this way, it can be used also for uh, compression or sense. Uh, Sensing compression or other types. So it is investigated in the topic in the first objective data privacy, but it can give idea to other domains and be very original because it hasn't been investigated in the past. And maybe a last, uh, last point. I see that last remark. Uh, so you mentioned special transformers, and I had to send that down as well. So, so, uh, because uh, when you you have these uh, models for uh, predicting partitioning of that's very more detailed uh, question partitioning of the loose uh, uh, spread trees or river trees. Uh, then, all the people, as far as I could understand, they, they process each CPU in a sequential manner. And for each CPU, they apply their model and they, they decide which is the best. And so, it's sequential. And it's true that uh, in computer vision, uh, the transformers have, uh, have brought a lot because uh, the, the network sees all the patches uh, at the same time. So it's really a, a fast because it's parallel processing. So you, as you said, you have all the patches that you feed into the transformer. The transformer finds the similarity between the patches and it makes the best decision for all together. So I, I think that for uh, for deciding the best mode partition coding or whatever, this this should make sense. But you said it was too complex. So I'm wondering why. Because you see, in the transformers, you have the encoder part and the decoder part. But when so because it, it comes from natural language processing, where they want to translate a sentence in one language into another sentence in another language. Uh, but in, uh, when they use it in vision, actually, they, they only often they take only the encoder part. Uh, so that would still be too complex. Or usually, if you take a complex number of parameters in the compact transformer, the largest uh, convolutional neural network, you are not at the level of uh, 100,000 parameters, 200 kilos, but at a million parameters. So this reason I was a little bit uh, 
less uh, optimistic uh, for this problems where competing is uh, important. For example, we investigate transformer for federated learning because no one has uh, investigated transformer in a federated place uh, to aggregate them and to see how to relate to react to bad evolution or not. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, to work on transformer for other problems, for example, for TPA prediction, uh, to consider different parts of the face, there is squares or not between the, the ices, bones, and detect some inference. Uh, but for the problem of complexity, it can work, uh, it can give good results, uh, but then uh, it's uh, more difficult to uh, go further. Uh, by having something, because in video encoding, we are always targeted to uh, using the complex to uh, introduce these models into uh, products or into their uh, partners. So uh, we cannot buy this uh, entire complexity uh, compared to other uh, projects where we don't care. We just want to show that uh, it works, to uh, make advancing. Okay, so congratulations again, and thanks a lot for your, for the discussion. Uh, so I guess uh, there are only two persons that I will be trying to do. <laughs> okay. So I wish you make uh, uh, a room. Yeah. Other than the yes. Uh, Yes, but Maria, I will affix to uh, the room. Then, uh, yes. I could not hear very well. Okay, I will move to the front room, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, the sound is much better, I think. Yes, definitely. <laughs> it was not easy to follow some parts. Yeah, the I, but, uh, uh, that's I okay, it worked at the end. <laughs> I think they had the problem that they had several microphones simultaneously in the room. That is always a problem for Zoom. And maybe speakers near to the laptop. I'm not sure. Speakers from the room near to the laptop. or. But if there's only one microphone, it's not, never a problem. But if you if you have several microphones, then the speakers in the room are not knowing which microphone to compensate. And yeah, I started hearing something from the room. I'm not sure if because now we are supposed to be connected with the rest of the panel. I think, right? I, I think so. I think the the participant Vasim Hamidush is is the remaining people. Of the committee, and I'm not sure. yeah, I'm not sure if I've seen uh, Midush laptop is okay. Can you hear us? Yes, yes. okay, great. I, I tried to put the video on, but somehow I can't. I don't know why this is not working. Just to show you our faces, like you are kindly sharing your faces with us. Uh, but no, I can't. Can't you? Somebody works on the video, why is it not working? This is, in, uh, why is it recording? Let me check something. I don't know, oh, yeah. good point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can stop the recording. Do we need to record? No, we don't, we don't want to record. We don't want to record. <laughs> right, let me call 